Thank you, Sarah, for that introduction. It's really great to join you again. And on behalf of the Center for South Asia, I would like to also thank our co-sponsors at UW-Madison, IRIS, the Institute for Regional and International Studies, and LASIS, Latin American, Caribbean, and Iberian Studies. It's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker who will be presenting on Indo-Caribbean migration, cultural continuity, change, and identity formation. Professor Lomar Shrupnarain is Professor of Latin American and Caribbean Studies at Jackson State University, an HBCU and Comprehensive Research University in Jackson, Mississippi. Professor Rupnarain earned his bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees from SUNY Albany, specializing in Latin American and Caribbean studies. His work is interdisciplinary in scope, and it draws on history, sociology, economics, and even environmental science in exploring issues of labor migration, human rights, resistance, and environmental challenges. His work also explores issues of social identity formation of and among Caribbean ethnic groups of East Indian, African, and Hispanic descent. A native of Guyana, Professor Rupinarayan has published three books and over three dozen articles on the South Asian diaspora in the Caribbean. His most recent book, The Indian Caribbean Migration and Identity in the Diaspora, was a 2018 recipient of the Caribbean Studies Association, Gordon Kay and Sybil Lewis Book Award. Please join me in welcoming Professor Rupinarayan. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction, um, Ms. Chairperson. I really appreciate that. And thank you, um, the audience, uh, for joining here today. What I think will be a rather interesting um, presentation. Allow me, however, to share two, two things. First, um, a little bit about my background. And second, how the Indian, Indo-Caribbean that label there has evolved over time. On the first uh, issue or thing, I was born and raised in Guyana, a country that's located um, in the northeast shoulder of South America. Um, it's considered part, part of the Caribbean. Along the banks of the Currentine River in the county of Berbice, which is home to uh, about 120,000 East Indians or Indians who were brought from India in the middle of the 19th century um, to work on the sugar plantations. And when the contract expired, they, they stayed on. And so I'm a, a descendant of these people and I'm the fourth generation. I'm the first generation really to out migrate out of Guyana and to be living here in the United States, even though I go back and forth to the Caribbean. The other thing I wanna to talk to you about really is how this idea how Indians have been labeled in the Caribbean ever since they arrived in the region in the middle of the 19th century. When East Indians were brought to the Caribbean, they were called East Indians. They made a lot of sense because they um, came from India. However, by the 19th, late 19th century, early 20th century, they were called East Indian West Indian or East Indians living in the West Indies or live in the Caribbean. The label sound, sounded rather colorful, but it was confusing. And so by the Second World War, uh, Indians were given another label. They were called Indians. And so the East were dropped. And so now Indians were called Indians in the Caribbean, mainly because they have started to settle. And they've now seen the Caribbean as their homeland. By the 1980s and onwards, they were called Indo-Caribbean, hyphenated, like the South Asian Americans or African, Amer African Americans in the United States. So what you've seen on the screen there is really Indo-Caribbean, the term has been used recently. I think we have reached a stage now that the term or the label needed a new sort of explanation mainly because Indians now have out migrated from the Caribbean to different parts of the world, especially to the United States along the Atlantic seaboard and have settled and formed diasporas. So I came up with this, this term Atlantic Indians, really to look at how Indians have really scattered from the Caribbean to different parts of the world without missing the connection or denying the connection to to India. And um, so I'll use that as a jumpstart to my presentation. As you can see on the screen, 
I'll be talking about migration, cultural change, cultural maintenance of cultural continuity and identity formation. Okay, so let's look at the reasons why Indians are brought to the Caribbean. And one can understand the movement from India to the Caribbean using really, by using really the push model, push pull model of migration, um, using or, or based on a macro, micro analysis. Macro meaning looking at the broad features that led to the arrival of, of Indians to the Caribbean and micro features that really the personal, really, features that related to their personal lives in India that led to them coming to the, to the, to the Caribbean. So then looking at the full, full aspects of this model, um, after the abolition of slavery in the Caribbean, African slaves are now become free, withdrew from the plantation um, to seek work elsewhere. And naturally then there was a shortage of labor on the plantations. Now the planters class or the plantocracy thought it was better to bring in foreign labor as opposed to use existing labor because there were tensions between the newly freed, newly freed Africans and, and the planters class. And to resolve this sort of impasse, this social or economic tug of war, the, the planters class opted for foreign labor. And it made sense to some degree from a planter's point of view that um, India was under the, the, the rule of, of, of colonialism or under British, and most of the Caribbean islands were also under British rule. And so it was easier or much less cum cumbersome to transport the, what is then called a subject from one part of the colony to another. So that was the premise really of, 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 of the pull pr premise really from the Caribbean to bring East Indians from India to the, the Caribbean. And during this period of time, Indians were tried in places like Mauritius under the contract labor system, which proved rather, rela rather reliable. And so the planters class were encouraged by that. And so they pushed for bringing in Indians to the Caribbean. I must say also that the Chinese were used, the Portuguese and even Africans, for some reason or the other, they proved unreliable in terms of supplying labor um, to the sugar industry. Many um, were ill-suited. Some when the contracts expired, they outmigrate to other areas. So that did not work. But the Indian labor was considered reliable, mainly because um, for reasons I will state later on. Now on the, the Indian side in India, the push factors. Well, as you know, or, you know, India was really impacted very much by colonialism, but I'll focus here really in the areas where the migrants um, came from. And that was really more in the rural areas, in the peasantry. Um, where many were tied to the land, either on a small scale level or, or working with, with, a, with a landlord or landlords in that region. And when the, the impact of, of, of British colonialism really broke down this traditional base of existence and that the entire economy was really transformed from a small scale to a large scale. In that process, the, the small person, so to speak, existence was displaced. And so that um, caused out migration. And many Indians then migrated to various areas in India. And so they became potential recruits for labor, not only to the car. Caribbean, but all elsewhere in the world, so forth. Also, um, there were a number of natural disasters in India that led to the pool of, of potential migrants to the Caribbean, um, such as famine and floods and so forth. The thing is that the British government did not create natural disasters, but when the death disaster did strike, they were not in a position or they did not address these conditions 
in a way in a way that will assist these Indians. In other words, when disaster struck, many of the peasants or the people in rural areas were left high and dry. And so in order to seek out a, a living, many really uh, migrated out. And again, they added to the pool of migrants who were looking to survive. And so they contracted themselves to the Caribbean. There was also civil disobedience, like the Indian Mutiny of 1857, that led to um, a, a lot of problems within the Indian military, the Indian servicemen in particular, towards British colonialism. British colonialism was insensitive to the needs of Indian um, the ways, culture, um, the culinary habits, and so forth. And so there was a resistance. And so to avoid persecution, many of the servicemen contracted themselves elsewhere. And so many ended up in the Caribbean, like for example, the Rajput Indians. Now let's look at the micro reasons. That is the reasons that were really on the ground in India that caused many of the Indians to, re to, to indenture themselves overseas. And I'll ex explain the term indenture later on as we go along. Some were duped. Um, they were given fanciful stories about how if you sign a contract to the Caribbean, then you might become rich. They were given um, false information for example, look, you're going to Sri Ram because Sri Ram sounds like Suriname, a place in the Caribbean where in East Indies are recruited to labor. Um, they were told, well, look, you're going to Trinidad. Trinidad sounds like, like Trinidad and China misrepresenting the distance. And so a number of stories were really, um, false stories really, were given to these recruiters who were, des um, to the, sorry, to these um, peasants were unemployed and because they're so desperate, many of them signed contracts to, to, to go overseas. Many also um, were tied into social and personal um, suppression, oppression. Some were tied to the landlords in ways that replicate slavery. Some were tied into oppressive social systems like the caste system, personal relations were not well. And so, um, many of these um, potential recruits um, wanted to get out and whenever there was opportunity, they did. Some also left on, uh, on a free basis. They simply want to find employment. They wanted a steady work um, so they can sustain the survival. So they signed contracts to, to go to the Caribbean. Others really were adventurous. Um, like, for example, the dancing girls, the temple girls who ended up in Suriname in the 1870s, they were used on board the ships to appease the, 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 um, the immigrants so they wouldn't resist and so forth. Now, where did this, these um, immigrants come from in India? Well, a majority of them were really agricultural people. As I said, many of them were unemployed, and they came from Bihar, Bengal, and they in the current state of Uttar Pradesh. A number also came from South India in the Madras area, what they call Madrasi in the Caribbean, but also um, some Punjabi, Punjabis also um, emigrated to the Caribbean during the period of indenture. Okay. Um, now let's look at the numbers. How many of, of a second here. How many of these Indians were brought to the Caribbean? And I want to concentrate here on the various colonies, the various numbers, and the various time, time frame, because it will tell us a lot of a lot of things. Now, if you look at a country, you will see, or the colonies, if you will, you will see that the East Indians were taken to British Guyana, Trinidad, for example, if you go down Suriname, Guadeloupe, and then onwards to French Guyana, Belize, and so on. It, it shows that the European powers in the Caribbean, the, the, the French, the British, the Dutch, and even the Danish were interested in bringing Indians to the Caribbean to really resolve the labor shortage there and to resuscitate the industry. And so in indentured labor, was a very important source 
in sustaining the economy of the Caribbean at this time, and various European powers um, tapped into this. And so um, not only did the, these European powers interested in indentured labor, but also the Spanish, the Spaniards. But however, the British government denied the request because the, um, the government was not too sure that Indians would be treated well in the Spanish colonies of the Caribbean that was still where slavery was still in style or in practice. And so what the Spanish government did instead, instead of bringing in East Indians, they brought in over 200,000 Chinese indentured contract laborers. And so that solved that labor problem there. Now, what is also interesting about these countries, you will find, you will see that what, only Suriname within the Dutch um, colonies of the, in the Caribbean experiment with indentured labor, mainly because the other islands, Aruba, Curaçao and so forth, were not plantation-based um, colonies, were based really on the production of salt and so on. And so there's a need for East Indian indentured labor there. But if you look at the, the, the country in Belize, um, which is in South Central America, that, that movement there was really unusual. Indians went to um, Jamaica first, and then they were transported after spending some time there, they were transported from Jamaica to Belize, a sort of a secondary migration. That was really unusual. Also, um, there's one shipload that went to the Danish West Indies, which, was, uh, which is St. Croix, which is today the United States Virgin Islands. I wrote the entire book on that, mainly because I had been on an island for 10 years and had access to the information there. Now let's move on and look at the various numbers and the time frame. And what is important here is that there is a correspondence or there's a connection between the, the num numbers and the time frame. The, in that the larger the numbers, the larger the time frame. The lesser the numbers, the lesser the time frame. And so that is telling us something there. For example, in British Guyana, which is the largest recipient of Indians to the, to the, to the Caribbean, it lasted for over 75 years. We have to go down here on this table, you, you will see that only one shipload pretty much went to Nevis, which was a British um, colony in the in middle um, Caribbean. Um, and so what was going on really was that these numbers and time frame um, speaks to the fluctuation and the instability of the mono crop, cropping economic system in the Caribbean at the time versus the diversification of the economy. So whenever the economy was not doing well, then the, it dictated the inflow of Indians from India to the Caribbean. And also, it also the lower numbers also speak to the fact that many of these islands perhaps, or was re, were really phasing out sugar um, production as a way of generating um, the revenues, okay? So I'll now move on and look at the population, the size. One second here. Okay, population statistics. Now, we do not have the exact figures of how many Indians were brought to the Caribbean, but the 500,000 seems to be a very a satisfying, satisfying figure. Um, and many scholars have been using these figures, but uh, there, there are some problems with it. I don't have time to discuss that now, but for now, the, the 500,000 will work. Now, if you look at the year 1838 and 1917, what that is saying that Indians start to arrive in the Caribbean in 1838, and then um, the, the, the indenture system continue until 1917, when immigration was seized, not necessarily indenture system, the immigration in India was seized. And so um, 
the denture system actually ended in 1920, and the repatriation, repatriation of Indians continued until 1955, when the last ship from British Guyana left with about 325 Indians. After that time, this indenture system pretty much ceased. Now, 350,000 stayed in the Caribbean, and I'll explain reasons why they stayed as we go along with this presentation, and 175 returned when their contract expired. Now, 50,000 of this 175,000 returned for the second time in the Caribbean. And this is rather interesting, mainly because it poses one of the most, fun, one of the most fundamental questions regarding the indentured system, whether it was a new slave system or it was beneficial to the Indians or the indentured Indians. The question is, why would 50,000 people want to come back for a second time if their experience in the Caribbean was bad. You know, it seems to me that they were weighing India, 19th century India, with that of the Caribbean, and they came up with the idea that the Caribbean was, was better. But that, again, that's a, that's a question for another time. It'll take up a, a lot of time uh, of, this of this presentation. So I'll explore that perhaps in a Q&A session. Um, now, what is the indenture system? I talked about this quite a bit um, in this presentation so far. Really, pretty much is a cyclical system um, revolving over five years. The, the indentured Indians signed contracts in India and they were transported on the ships and they came to the Caribbean, work on the plantations. They were given fixed wages, um, basic housing, uh, fringe benefits and a return passage when the contract expired. Um, and in exchange, they had to provide labor for the planters plus, which um, was subject to various ordinances. And the, the labor, labor contract was very rigid, uh, so much so that if it was violated, um, Indians would find quite a bit that, will, that will amounted to like a year, um, work or year um, savings. Now, by the 1860s, it dawned upon the planters class that it would be beneficial, not only for the plantation system, but for the contract Indians themselves. So you know, why send them back? They, they are now in the Caribbean, they become seasons to, season to plantation life. Uh, why send them back to, to India where they'll be um, unemployed or perhaps be, um, treated poorly because they broke um, the caste system. They left the community, a tight community, and then um, for five years and never been heard of, and then they're coming back. And so they're coming back to a, a sort of a, a restricted social system that did not allow out migration. So the, these ideas were weighed uh, between um, the planters class as well as the benefits for Indians. And so they were given, the Indians were given $50 to re-indenture. And $50 amounted to really about um, one year savings. Now, here I give you a sort of a timeline here in terms of how the indenture system pan out. By 1873, the, the planters class said, listen, this bounty system seemed to be working well. So they, they took it to another level. So what they did, they came up with this plan to say, listen, instead of using this, this return passage, which was like about 10 pounds, uh, which is quite a bit of money then, um, to use to send these Indians back, why not give them a piece of land in exchange for the 10 pounds? And so from, by the ninth, by 1870s, then there was this gradual, the movement to have Indians settled in the Caribbean by giving them pieces of land in exchange for the return passage. The plan worked pretty, pretty much, pretty well. And that by the 1890s or even from the 1880s onwards, there appeared a, a cluster of Indian settlements alongside the, um, the, 
the plantations. However, by the 1890s, because the planter class now seemed to have an upper hand in the indentured system, um, they asked the, the change of laws really um, requiring Indians now to contribute to the return passage. Um, the men had to contribute to one third of their passage, which is totally free to start with, and women had to contribute a quarter. What this really did, it not, did not only took away, did not only take away savings from these indentured Indians, but also it discouraged them to return back to India because it was too expensive. And um, they all, the Indians also were, were, were seeing that all the Indians were settling in the Caribbean. And so they decided, many decided not to go back to India abandon the idea to return. Now, I'm not sure if you're able to see this part of the screen. In 1920, the system was abolished um, for a number of reasons. Uh, one was that Gandhi was involved in South Africa there, and he was speaking out against the abuses of Indians, not only in racism against the apartheid system there, but also in Dinche system in South Africa that then spread in the overseas colonies in the Caribbean, that movement, but also the formation of the Indian National Congress and which had looked into the colonial conditions there under the British rule. And one condition really was um, moving towards independence. So um, the, this movement towards independence also um, examine the, the indentured system overseas in terms of abuse, whether Indians are protected and so on. And so that led to the collapse of the indentured system. Also, it was difficult really to transport human cargoes, if you will, human beings across the high seas, across the Indian Atlantic Ocean after World War II. And that then again, that led to the, um, the abolishment of the indentured system. It was not safe to transport human beings across high seas. In the colonies itself, there are enormous tensions in the Caribbean um, at the highest level, not among politicians, uh, within the plantocracy itself, and then between the various ethnic groups. They have been used against each other so long, the concept of divide and rule, that by the turn of the early 20th century, these tensions tend to be uh, had become very national ethnic tensions that still last to this day. So these are some of the problems that led to the collapse of the system that started really in the middle of the 19th century. It went through various of stages. It began in a cyclical manner and it panned out in ways that Indians now had become settlers in the Caribbean. And that, if I refer you back to the numbers, then that would explain why 500 came, 350 stayed, 175 went back, another 50,000 um, came back for the second time. That today in the Caribbean, Indians make up the majority population, about 400,000 in Guyana, um, another 500,000 in Trinidad, and about the same figure in Suriname, where they are a majority population. In other areas of the Caribbean, they've made up significant um, population size, but they were a minority in places like Martinique and Guadeloupe, French Guyana, in the other areas, the smaller islands of the Caribbean, um, like in St. Vincent, Jamaica, um, St. Nevis, um, St. Vincent, Grenada, and so forth, they are they remain a minority of minorities, and they're pretty much um, absorbed into the, the Creole Caribbean society, where the identity uh, is more Euro-African, but more African. I will explain that later on when I talk about identity. Uh, these Indians, um, this, this with a smaller population, they have little connection with India, at least in culture. Um, whereas in, in Guyana, Trinidad and Suriname, where they have become to form the majority of population, they have made, maintained thing, um, a lot of Indian customs, uh, and so on, which I'll explain later on as I move along with this presentation. Okay, um, what about the organization of the indentured system? 
it was really based on a hierarchical system. There was a top, really, the British system was obviously run by the British government. And then you had the, the Indian colonized government, which really took care of the recruitment and immigration um, in India and um, really examined what happened in the Indian agencies um, and also the depot where Indians were held before um, debarkation or transportation to the Caribbean and on board the ships. In the, in the Caribbean colonies, um, there was a really an immigration department that really regulate the, um, the distribution and how plantation work were operated on the plantation itself. It was a complex process and perhaps again, we can um, talk about that in QA section. The, 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 the Indians themselves, the workers had what's called a protector of Indians in each colony. So should there emerge a problem or a complaint or many complaints, the, um, the Indians then will go to the protector and the protector will take their, their, their concern through the chain of command up to the highest level where the cases could be heard at the magistrate court, for example. The problem with this, the protector of the Indians, many of them really um, were rubbing shoulders with the plutocracy. And so the, the concerns of the Indians were not uh, treated as expected. Now, the problem here, the general problem, overall problem, was that the British government were too distant from the day-to-day -day actions or the day-to-day -day beat of the plantation system to have effective control over the system. Really a colonized government, which actually took a hands-off approach to the indentured system. And again, in the, Car in the Caribbean colonies, the... Um, the, the plantocracy there had really had enormous power with politics of concern. And so that was pretty much the, um, the organization of the indenture system was a three-way hierarchical system. It sounded, it looked rather very great on paper, but in reality, there were a lot of loopholes that the, 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 um, the people in power manipulated at a, a great length. The, the thing is that the Indians indenture labor by, com by, by actually by obvious means, they did not have much say. They, their say really was to provide labor um, without disrupting the, the entire plantation system. And many did so, but there were resistance as well as accommodation on the plantations during the spread of indenture system. So even though the system was very rigidly organized and the Indians then were not totally victims of it, uh, that happened, yes, but they use um, whatever means of, of techniques they had to make the best out of this plantation system. I wrote an entire book on that, Resistance and Accommodation in the Indo-Caribbean Experience. So those of you interested perhaps may want to um, check that out. Um, okay, what about the, the um, I think I realize you're not able to see the screen here. There we go. Now you can see the screen, I think. Um, diversity of the immigrant labor population. Yes, they all came from India generally, but they were very diverse, um, like India itself. Now, 80% were Hindus, 14% were Muslims, four or five percent were other religions like Punjabi Sikhs, some were Christians, but fundamentally, many of them were low caste Hindus, and it comprised over 70% of them and 25% were middle caste and another 5% were high caste. You may ask, well, why would the high caste want to come to work on the um, a labor regimen that was, was very um, somewhat similar to slavery? Well, many left to be caused it fallen hard times. Many were also adventurous. Many also wanted to start a new beginning, uh, a new association in the overseas the colony and many of them who were, uh, had problems thought this was an option to start a new life by retaining their high status. Now, 25% were females, um, uh, meaning that for every 100 males, there were 25 females, uh, which means then there was a, a really a, a sex disparity this will create a lot of problems in the colonies in terms of 
and personal relationships, but also it created a lot of um, unique um, situation, which was in contrast to that of India. And I will talk about more of that later on in this presentation. Now, out of this diversity, I, I think what happened was a sort of forged commonality. So if you look on the left-hand side of your screen, the differences really was, were really in religion, caste, gender disparity, and languages. Now, Indians brought a number of different languages with them, but fundamentally, they were versed in Hin Hinduism, I'm sorry, Hindi, and also in Urdu. Now, what had happened, and this is rather interesting, that um, the diversity of India, I believe, exists because there's of space. India is a large space, a large country. And so the various diversities can be practiced because of this large space, using geographies uh, as a point of, of reference there. But when these Indians were brought to the depot, they then form commonality of, of deeper brothers and sisters because of the small space in this depot. They had no choice, so to speak. So those who were Muslims, those who were Hindus, those who were high caste or low caste tend to come together. And, and, and as well as on the ships, on, on the way from, from the port of Calcutta, for example, to, to the port of Georgetown, which lasted, um, that void lasted for three months. So they formed Jahi, Jahai he Bahai and Jahai Bahin, brothers and sisters of the ships. Now, on the plantations themselves, um, they carry this this brotherhood and sisterhood and form what is called um, fictional ties. So, in the communities, people are not related biologically, and so they form this sort of fish fish fish. Sorry, fish, no, I'm getting tired. Of it. Fictional relationships with each other based on many um, commonalities and differences in India, as opposed to based on biological connections. Now, what are some of the cultural continuity among Indians in the Caribbean? So now I'm here at a point looking what actually happened in the Caribbean following the emancipation of indenture from 1920 onwards to the current period. Well, Hinduism survived, it survived the crossing from India, to the Indian, the Atlantic and Indian Ocean to the Caribbean, as well as Islam, various festivals like, um, like, like Holi, Diwali, and so on are still practiced in the Caribbean with sort of some, some changes various music, musical traditions, films, for example, Bollywood films are, are seen in many areas of the Caribbean, like in Suriname, Guyana, and Trinidad. Also begging, um, social begging, um, like in India, was transferred um, to the Caribbean, uh, not as a sense of a disgrace, but rather a way of life. Uh, many people become so religious, and they meditate and fast and, and so on, instead of um, spending time working on the plantation, they spent the time meditating. And so when they got hungry, they stepped out of their home and started going from village to village to ask for a little meal to, to, to survive. So it was not really begging as seen in the West as a form of a, a negative thing. And that tradition has died out quite a bit in the Caribbean uh, as, as, as these countries have moved on um, towards the Western form of of government and traditions and so forth. Death, uh, birth and death ceremonies are also um, practiced, uh, for example, in nine day, the shaving of the head, um, death ceremonies like um, Shraddha, that's a practice in, in the Caribbean, in, again, places like Guyana and Suriname. Weddings and match weddings have been very much alive up to the 1980s, um, actually, and, and it's somewhat dying out now again, because of modernization in my own family, uh, two siblings um, who have married uh, going to match weddings. Um, now, what has changed? Uh, well, caste, the caste system did not survive the crossing, which was really the core of the Indian social structure. At least the peasants who were left in the 19th century India 
Now, a caste is really a, a form of social stratification, which individuals are born to specific stations of life, meaning that upward social mobility was limited. In other words, um, people, was, uh, people were um, ascribed to certain positions of life as opposed to achieved, like say, for example, in the United States, which revolved more on a, on a class system. Now, the Indians came from more four main caste system, and they are right there um, on the screen, the Brahmins, the Kshatriya, the Vaisya, and the Shudra, and the untouchables. The untouchables were not um, recruited. They were not considered even uh, to be recruited because they were below this caste system, the four main caste system. Of course, these are the, fin the four main ones, um, thousands of subcastes in India, and um, hundreds of subcaste Indians also made it on the ships to the Caribbean. Okay, um, why did the caste system did not survive? Um, mainly because one, many Indians, when they out migrated from a community, they were violating a community rules or community expectations or community social cohesion. Crossing the Kalapani was a big no-no. Um, and so the, those who crossed was considered polluted um, and so to reinstate back into the community, they had to uh, perform a ceremonial sort of um, uh, gathering, which will then, uh, which are then cost quite a bit of money to feast the, feast the gurus and the community to get back in. And even then when they got back in, the stain was not totally removed. Now in the Caribbean itself, when the Indians were there, the plantation system did not revolve around the social structure of Indian society and the peasant society where, where caste um, rules were respected from top to down, the top down layer of that, layers of that society. In the Caribbean, um, it, it revolved on the capitalist system of, of work, eight to 10 at night or eight to eight at night where Indians um, then were drawn in to this routine, which um, and on the plantation itself, the the managers, the leaders, um, did not respect caste rules or caste expectation, even Indian customs at all, and so that led to the break breakdown of the caste system. What's so interesting about this was the class, the, the caste system flipped in the Caribbean, whereas India, the the high caste was considered high, the low caste was considered low. In the Caribbean, they flipped the, 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 the low caste of value more because they performed uh, most of the work on the plantations that uh, was needed and that fit the expectations of the planters' class. The high caste did perform work, but they were more resistant to plantation labor naturally because they believed that their function in the Caribbean were more spiritual as opposed to providing minion labor for wages. Um, so, hang on here. So, what happened then? The, the, the plantation system provided opportunity for upward mobility among the lower caste that did not really exist, at least to the degree it existed on the plantations in the Caribbean. I don't want to get distracted here that now the Caribbean environment was a very um, a, a free from problems. There were a lot of tensions there, tensions between Indians and Africans, Africans and Europeans. It was a racially driven society, racially hierarchical structured society. So even though um, these uh, low caste Indians were experienced social, upward social mobility, even economic mobility, they were um, had to contend with the, the, the broader system the broader social, economic, and political system with itself replicate or resembles India in terms of hierarchy. It was also, I mean, it was almost a, a caste system in a different way, in a Caribbean sense, based on color. And one can think really of the apartheid system in South Africa, the Caribbean slave system, a post system, um, post slavery system really was based on color and race. 
And um, so when Indian got into the Caribbean, they brought this caste system was based more on social ranking, but well, of course, um, color as well. All of that pan out in a way that um, it, it reversed in the Caribbean. It reversed and it, it now led to the beneficial, became beneficial to, to the low caste. Um, now, the caste system broke down, they would call it the Caribbean high and low nations. These are new terms used instead of, of the four categories I just showed you on the screen, the previous screen, what, what emerged really is, is high because they class and, and low, low, low class or low nation. What that means that anyone could really become a Hindu pundit, even a woman can become a priest in the Caribbean, more flexible um, than in India. The comparative speaking in time frame in 19th century India and onwards, as well as 19th century Caribbean and onwards. Now, in India, as I understand it, the, the, the roles of, of the priests um, in the north or south India is pretty much religious uh, with strict sort of um, culinary habits and ways and, and, and social expectations and so forth. In the Caribbean, that's not a case. It's not a case. Um, a pandit could be, or a priest, can be someone who will perform um, religious functions, or religious needs, in the Indian community on the Sundays and on other days, but also can do other work. He can be a shopkeeper. He can be a liquor store um, person selling liquor. Um, he can do other works. He could, he could work on sugar plantations and so forth. In other words, a priest in the Caribbean carries more than one hat. Now, the caste system has survived um, more in ideology rather than in practice, um, meaning that um, you'll find that some Indians, high-class Indians, will refer to low-class Indians as chamar or, or low caste, where they're frustrated with the process or where they're frustrated um, uh, even with the children, they accuse them of behaving like a low caste Indian. But, but that is more ideological, it has little bearing, it's, it does affect the day to day life, and many people can easily dismiss that. But it's there, it's there. Um, okay, um, over to women. Now, women, Indian women, as I said earlier, um, had a, this, a sexual, a sexist party on the plantation. And so because of the low numbers, one would think, well, they were at a disadvantage. Yes, that it happened. But um, in terms of subjected to abuse on the ships, not only by European um, men who were conducting the system on board the ship, as well as plantation, but also by Indian men. In other words, the, the Indian women were caught between um, European masculine patriarchy and Indian patriarchy, and they fashioned a life of existence with, between this patriarch to patriarchal system. Again, I could talk about that some other time or in the Q&A session. Now, what had happened on the plantation was that even though the caste system had, had broken down, Indians did not gravitate totally to a different social structure. They were in flux. And so then they practice certain things that were still tied into the caste system. And that is, they preferred to marry their own. They preferred to marry it within their own ethnicity and instead of other ethnicity. So marriages, Indian marriages, um, were arranged within the ethnicity. And so even though the caste system was abolished, um, was, was dismissed among Indian themselves, Certain, certain practices in the caste system carried on. So what is what is meant then that the shortage of women then led to a problem. There were more men and few women. And so what happened in a very rather interesting way, it was not uncommon to see a one woman cohabiting with three men on the plantation, mainly because Indian men did not want to marry or want to cohabitate outside of the ethnic group. Again, they were socialized along the caste line, were socialized according to, to the custom India, and some of that survived. Now, don't get me wrong. 
some, some Indians um, did marry um, other ethnic groups of Africans, but were very small. And it's small to this day, small in terms of patent percentage. Um, so then the question then arises, um, the, the fact that Indian women, one Indian woman can marry or cohabitate with three or four men, does that mean that Indian women were freer? Or did that lead to other forms of dependency? Certainly it was not like India, it would reverse. And the bright price and, and all of that all got reversed in the Caribbean. And so that's the question that's still um, yet to be explored in the Indian indentured scholarship, that, the, that the, the arrival of Indian women during the, the indentured system, did it lead to their freedom or did it lead, did it lead to renewed forms of dependency. And in my opinion, I think that Indian women, when compared to India, had experienced more freedom, especially um, soon after the indenture period. Um, and moving on, again, we can address that in the QA section. Um, now, some thoughts on Indian identity. And I'm going to share a few with you, and, and then I will um, talk to you before for ideas or for concepts of Indian identity as a form of alternative to what I'm going to share here now. Now, it is believed that Indians um, have retained quite a bit India in the Caribbean, so the identity revolves around that, like, for example, Hinduism, Hindu culture. Um, and then there's a, the opposite side of that, that Indians have assimilated towards a Caribbean culture, the concept called creolization. And that is a process whereby Africans in the Caribbean had adopted European forms as well as African forms, cultural or otherwise, and they had produced something new, something hybrid, that it's not totally like Europe, not totally like Africa, but more like Caribbean. So then if you look at a Caribbean person, they may dress like person of India, and they may speak like an American or, or British person, but they have Caribbean characteristics. They speak, they, they expect Caribbean ways like carnival, Caribbean culture. And so that is creolization, really the mixing of European and African form to, solve, to form a new hybrid um, culture that is indigenous to the Caribbean. Okay. The next one is coolitude, and this uh, really was developed by a fellow, a colleague of mine, um, called Taraboli. And the concept here is that why, why really carry the burden of this indentured system, this is so-called coolie system. A coolie is a derogative term in the Caribbean, is 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 to make it short, it's a C word of the Indians. And so why carry the C word? Um, why not use it in a positive way by looking at what's good about it from India to the Kalipani, the voyage to the Caribbean? Well, that makes quite a bit of sense. Why be why stuck with the past? Why not see ways in dealing with the past and move forward? Uh, and again, I don't have the time here to talk about the, the pro and cons of these concepts, but I developed what is called a coleology to counteract that in a way that we cannot we cannot really put a band-aid on, on the, 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 the Indian experience and say look you know we just can't gloss over the sufferings we have to use you have to understand the sufferings impact in order to move forward um, for example there is no penalty for using the c-word it's not considered a slur in fact in some places used as a style now, if that's not addressed, how, how can we can we deal? How can we gloss over the past to, to, to look um, and to make it positive? Anyway, so so I I, I introduced that concept of coleology, and again, you know, I'm in the process of developing that some more. Now, there is a in Guyana, it's a dogmatization in Trinidad it's called dogmatization. What this really means is a mixing uh, between Africans. And the and Indians, the offsprings are called dogalization or dogla. And um, there are in Guyana, for example, about um, I would say about 15% of the population 
uh, our dogla. And um, in Trinidad, it's more like 20%. Um, now, the idea here of racial mixing at first initially was seen as an embarrassment to the Indian population that when you marry out again, as I said earlier, um, was like, you know, you're dis denouncing your, your ethnicity, you're moving away from your culture if you marry another ethnic group. Again, Indians were socialized this way in India in the 19th century and they retained some of this. So it, it, it makes sense that they will think that way. But the thing is that if an Indian marry an African and the, the couple move towards an Indian side, chances are they'll be less accepted to the, to the, um, to the in Indian community because of our embar embarrassment and so on, even though that's changing. But if they move to the African side of the community, chances are they will be incorporated more. But however, the incorporation would be more towards the creolization process, towards the creolization process. All right. Now, all these, what I've said just now, are a pretty great, great um, um, identities of Indians, and it will take us all day here to, to elaborate them on more, some more. But I want to share with you four alternative sorts of, of identity, and I know I'm running out of time here. I can so I'm going to go through this somewhat quickly, and then we can discuss them later on. Now. I, I come up with, I did not want to replicate what I've just said there in terms of the, the various identities in your know, screen, the previous screen. But I, I thought that sharing an alternative way of looking at in, in, in Indian identity would be rather interesting. And um, I look at migration and geography. I look at Indian migrated, settling out migrate. The, the event, their identity evolved according to the locality. So the first one is ethno-local, the second ethno-national, and the other ethno-trans-Caribbean, and the other is ethno-national. Now, quickly speaking, ethno-local really is the retention of the ancestral identity in a particular area based on religion, Hinduism, and ecology, working the land, like red, the planting of rice or red cultivation. Because of this combination of these two activities, one culture, one physical, that replicates someone like India, Indians were able to reestablish this ethno-local identity, mainly because one, they were brought to the Caribbean, they were in isolated communities, and they were not exposed to other communities. Um, again, the idea of the, the planters' idea of, of divide and rule, if you did, you place these different groups in different environments, easier to manage them or to control them against um, resistance and revolutionary movements. And also the Westernization, um, resistance to Western ways, especially Christianity. Many Indians did not want to become Christians. In fact, the Brahmins were evident about that. They, they resist that to collectively within the temples, within the, the mandirs. What is this movement have done is to consolidate these Indians in a particular area so that if you go to Burbese, Guyana, or currently in Guyana, you think you're some part of India. If you go to the Barakpur, Trinidad, you think you're in Indian, as well as Nani Pole, Suriname. It's a unique form of identity, which is, is somewhat I mean, challenged mainly because of um, its, its it's marginalized from the, from the, from the national consciousness because, um, because of political reasons. These, these um, people or the Indians who live in these communities tend to favor and tend to vote for their own, own ethnic group. And because of that, the, the, the other political side or the other political ethnic group will tell them, tend to see them as being unassimilated to the national consciousness. Okay, I hope that makes sense somewhat, but we can talk about that later on. I'm trying to go through a couple more slides here and I'll stop. Now, ethno national, national identity departs from ethno local. It's more really when Indians in the Caribbean express the identity alongside ethnicity and a nation. So then, if you ask somebody in Guyana, who are you, an Indian? They will say most likely, yes, they will say Guyanese, but if you push it more within an environment where you have all the different ethnic groups, it's look, I am an Indo-Guyanese. 
what a person is saying there is not giving up the ethnicity and um, it, it's tagging along ethnicity with nationality. It's a very interesting concept. Now, the, the, this national, in, this ethnic national identity does not have to be expressed in a nation state. It doesn't have to be anchored in a nation state. It could be expressed in the United States, for example. I, I, in fact, it has been expressed in the United States because many Asians or Indians of the Caribbean do not want to be conflated with the identity, for example, of South Asian because they're so different. And so then in Canada, for example, Toronto, when Indians there from Guyana ask, who are you? It was the Indo-Guyanese. If, if you're asked, well, look, are you from India? I said, no, 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 I'm not from India. I am from a, I'm Indian, and, but I'm from Guyana. And so the person then is it's expressing um, the, this, this ethno-national identity based on locality, but it's not locality rooted in geography. And I'm thinking here of Benedict Addison concept of civic nation, that one can express a national identity outside of your geographical base, okay? All right, let me move on here with, um, the Trans-Caribbean identity. What, this is really, um, identity is not common, but it still exists in the Caribbean. Some Indians do not express themselves according to the local identity, or the local um, location, or even in the national government, because they feel uncomfortable, they feel excluded, but they tend to express themselves across the Caribbean where other Indians are. For example, um, an Indian in Guyana may say, look, I, I don't be, think I belong to Guyana. I belong across the Caribbean where all the Indians are, are, are settled, like Suriname and Trinidad. And this is really expressed more in religion. It's more cultural than rather political and to some degree economics. Um, all right. And then the, the last one is ethno-local or ethno-universal. And that is, it's not restricted to the local, to the national or Trans-Caribbean, it is global. And it has happened really because the Indians who were brought over during an indenture period in the Caribbean, have lived in the Caribbean for a long time and been disconnected with India to a point where they, last, they lost that connection. But with the, with the advent of globalization the last 20, 30 years, they have come together. So Indians now in the Caribbean was one, one had once been disconnected with India, are now able to know more about India, to travel, through conferences, through Bollywood firms, through organizations and associations, social media, and so on. So that uh, there is now a sort of universal understanding of, of Indians across the globe. And, and let, let me finish by saying this, the, um, the Indian government, um, the recent Indian government, the last 20 years have been given um, citizenship to overseas Indians, uh, and it, it takes a process. Um, it's not a straightforward, but yet it is offered with, um, with to, to Indians overseas, not only in the United States who have dis been disconnected with Indians in India, but also the former indentured colonies, which again facilitates this ethno-universal identity, and I will stop there. Thank you.